This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I am Amy Goodman in New York with co-host Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Good morning, Amy, and welcome to our listeners around the country and around the world. Well, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden is closing in on securing enough electoral votes to win the election after news outlets projected him winning two key states in the Midwest, Wisconsin and Michigan. According to the Associated Press, Biden has now secured 264 electoral votes. He will reach the needed 270 if he wins any of the four undecided races, Nevada, Georgia, North Carolina or Pennsylvania. Biden brief spoke, briefly spoke on Wednesday. And now, after a long night of counting, it's clear that we're winning enough states to reach 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. I'm not here to declare that we've won, but I am here to report that when the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. Trump made multiple false claims on Wednesday, suggesting Democrats are stealing the election. At one point, Trump wrote on Twitter he was claiming for electoral vote purposes the states of Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina and Michigan, even as votes are still being counted. The Trump campaign also filed lawsuits in Pennsylvania, Michigan and Georgia, and has requested a recount in Wisconsin. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf criticized the Trump campaign's lawsuit. This afternoon, the Trump campaign filed a lawsuit to stop the counting of ballots in Pennsylvania. That is simply wrong. It goes against the most basic principles of our democracy. To talk more about the election and to look at who turned out to vote in this historic election. We're joined by Democracy Now!'s own Juan Gonzalez, who's been closely looking at who turned out to vote. He's joining us from New Brunswick, New Jersey, where he's a professor at Rutgers University. So, Juan, it is astounding what has taken place in this country. We are talking about a record-smashing number of voters. It is believed over 150 million people voted. Can you talk about the demographics of the vote? Uh, in the last days, the main narrative has been, uh, before the election final day on November 3rd, uh, that African Americans and Latinos were not coming out to vote for Joe Biden to the extent that it was believed they would be. Um, but this is a narrative right now you are refuting. Uh, can you talk about your findings? Yes, Amy, and uh, I've been pouring over the numbers and trying to make sense of what happened uh, in this election. And this developing narrative uh, that uh, Latinos and, to some extent, African Americans shifted more toward uh, Donald Trump in this election, that they underperformed for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, I believe, is a largely false narrative. I think the main story of this election, as you mentioned, that saw record turnout, we won't have the exact numbers, but it looks like about 158, 59, 160 million people, uh, close to 160 million people voted. Uh, it, the main story is that people of color, especially Latinos, flocked to the polls in numbers that far exceeded what the experts had expected while the total number of votes cast by white Americans barely increased from the last presidential election. Uh, and most importantly, that white voters, including white women, voted at higher percentages for Trump this year than they did in 2016. So how come none of the experts are asking why white voters underperformed the Democratic Party? Uh, and, and let me be a little bit more specific. Uh, there, there does appear to have been some areas of the country where there was a an increase in the percentage of the Latino vote for Donald Trump, uh, specifically in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas uh, and in the Miami-Dade County, both of which, I should note, for those people who know the voting patterns of the Latino community, have always been relatively uh, 
conservative areas of the Latino community uh, in terms of voting. Uh, even though South Texas is largely Democratic, it's always been a moderate to centrist or, or conservative Democratic uh, 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 voting bastion. But my analysis of the numbers shows a completely different story when you look at the uh, country as a whole. And I'm doing this based on the exit polls that were most of the networks uh, use, which is the Edison National Election Poll, which has always been it's, it's been criticized in the past precisely because it uh, it gives uh, doesn't give correct numbers or doesn't give uh, valid numbers on the Latino community, but it's still the only uh, massive uh, exit poll that we have until we get uh, more scientific studies that come maybe months later or a year later. So first of all, the historic turnout, right? The, if we take the number of 159 uh, million, Last election was 136 million people voted. So we're talking about an increase of 23 million voters compared to the last election. Phenomenal increase. Who were those 23 million people uh, and uh, where did they come from? So I think I have a chart here. I hope the producers are able to put it up here. But you'll see that according to the exit polls, 13 percent of the Lati of the vote uh, came from Latino uh, uh, voters, Amer uh, Latino Americans. That represents 20.6 million P Latinos voted in this election. That is an incredible increase, 65 percent over the last election, which was already a record for Latinos when it was only 12.6 percent. For the first time in U.S. history, because Latinos have never voted uh, more than 50 percent of the eligible population. They've always been 45, 46, or even less. For the first time, about two-thirds of the eligible Latinos came to the polls. Eight million more Latinos voted in this election than voted in the last election. Then come the Asian Americans, a phenomenal turnout in the Asian American community, uh, 3.6 million more votes uh, than they than voted in uh, in 2016, and then African Americans also had an increase. Uh, they went from 17.1 million who voted in 2016 to 19 million, about 1.9 million. So that's an increase, but it's 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 not an increase as you might expect after a year or two years now of massive racial justice protests and the pioneering candidacy of Kam of Kamala Harris, but it's still an increase. So what about white voters, the largest sector of the electorate, but a diminishing portion? In 2016, 100 million whites voted in the election. In this election, 103 million voted, just 2.7 million increase in the total white vote in the country. So the bulk of the increase of the vote in this election came from people of color, largely Latinos. So now people say, well, uh, uh, but the but there was a slight percentage increase in the uh, among African Americans and Latinos for Trump. Well, percentages don't win elections. Votes win elections, right? And that's what you've got to understand. Would you rather have 70 percent of 12 million votes, or would you rather have 68 percent of 20 million votes? The increase has been so large, whereas the percentages have stayed roughly the same, that there has been there was enormous increase in the votes by Asian Americans, Latino Americans, and African Americans uh, for Biden and the Democratic Party. Uh, why was this? And I think the enthusiasm and the turnout of the Latinx community uh, was fueled by four years of constant Republican scapegoating and attacks on Latinos from the the, the disastrous response to uh, Hurricane Maria for the Puerto Rican community, to family separations, uh, and, and also to the terrible uh, response of the Trump administration to the coronavirus. And it is why Arizona and Nevada and Colorado uh, uh, are likely, it seems, to go for Joe Biden. And what has happened now is that there is a new brown belt voting bloc that is developing in the Southwest that includes Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, and very soon, Texas as well. Uh, so uh, the real underperformers in this election were white voters who not only did not have a qualitative increase in their vote totals, 
Uh, they dropped from 71 percent of the electorate to 65 percent of the electorate, but they voted in an even higher percentage for Trump this time than last time or than they did for John McCain in 2008. And this is especially true in uh, 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 among white women. They t so uh, so now. How is this possible, given the uh, years now of sexual uh, of uh, allegations of sexual assault uh, against Trump, uh, his d denigrating of women, his family separation policies, that white women increased the percentage of the vote that they gave to Donald Trump? What's up with that? <laughs> Why are all the commentators not dissecting what the heck is going on in white America and with white women in America. Uh, there, unfortunately, it seems to me, looking at the numbers, there is no gender gap. There's a racial gender gap in that African-American and Latina women are voting so overwhelmingly uh, for the Democratic Party, but not white women. And I think that needs to be analyzed more. And finally, I think the key issue here is that the United States being the world's in prime imperialist power with no real competition, uh, uh, and no real adversaries who threaten it, and may only China who can compete economically uh, with the United States, that we are a country that is increasingly moving to a situation where the Republican Party is moving more and more to be the party of white people in America. And the Democratic Party is increasingly becoming the party of the new multiracial majority of the American people. That's what I take from the results of this election, no matter who ends up actually winning the election or what happens with the Senate or what happens with the Congress. It's the developing trends in the electorate of America that are showing a, a enormous racial division uh, in, between the two parties and who they represent. That's Juan Gonzalez, Democracy Now! co-host and professor at Rutgers University, doing a deep dive, even as we're waiting to hear um, who has won the presidency in the United States, into the data. And, Juan, maybe you can talk about the kinds of narratives that developed over 2016, uh, the misinformation that continues to this day about who votes, um, like the more than half of white women who voted for Trump in 2016, you're exploding all of this. Uh, yes. Well, the the, the exit polls were uh, actually last uh, last time around were uh, considerably off on the. Uh, uh, on the, the women's vote. In fact, the Pew Center uh, later on and several other groups uh, did more extensive studies and found that uh, in the 2016 election, there was roughly a, a uh, an even vote between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton when it came to white women. I think it was 47 to 48 uh, percent, because, of course, there were third-party candidates back in 2016 that took a portion of the of the women's vote as well. Uh, so uh, it was 47 to 48. This time around, there is a clear majority uh, that is showing uh, that uh, white women are voting for Trump. And I don't think that there's been any real analysis of what's happened there. Uh, and, uh, and no, certainly no questioning by any of the political commentators that I've seen of why has Trump's support among white women increased <laughs> since 2016. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, while it has not, uh, uh, or or barely uh, uh, increased among African American and Latino women. I think that that is something that's really got to be looked at. Uh, you know, but I think that generally speaking, if you look at the historical trends, uh, there uh, it's about two thirds of uh, of Latinos. What going back to George Bush? So George Bush was the last Republican candidate that was able to get forty percent of the uh, Latino vote. Uh, and uh, Ronald Reagan, back in the 80s, got about 40 percent of the Latino vote. But back then, it was a much smaller pie. It was a much smaller vote. Now it's a much bigger vote. Uh, and so when you're in the uh, 28, 29, 30 percent as a Republican candidate, uh, that's really not a substantial change in the vote. Uh, you've got to get up into the 35 or 40 percent where you can claim there's there's actual real movement occurring uh, uh, in uh, in the Latino community. So it's the historical trend has been Republicans generally get about 
uh, between 25 to 35 percent of the Latino vote. Because remember, Latinos are a very disparate uh, group. Uh, there are many nationalities. Uh, the Because of migration, there's constant change. People are saying, well, South Florida voted more for Trump. Well, the South Florida of today is not the same South Florida uh, of uh, 10 years ago, uh, because there, South Florida has increasingly become the base area for all conservative Latin Americans, whether they're Nicaraguans uh, fleeing social change in Nicaragua, Colombians, uh, of increasingly Venezuelans, and of course the old style Cuban community. It is the it is the refuge area for all people fleeing social upheaval and social revolution in Latin America. So it's no surprise that there may have been a, 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 a conservative increase of the Latino uh, co a vote uh, in South Florida. Uh, and uh, uh, that's not a surprise at all. It's only a surprise to the people who don't pay attention to the evolution and the dynamics of the Latinx community across the country. Uh, but I think the key area is what's what's happened in Wisconsin, what's happened in Pennsylvania, what's happened in uh, in the Midwest, what's happened in Arizona, Nevada, where the bulk of the Latinx community uh, uh, exists, and of course Texas, uh, where uh, where the bulk of the Latinx community lives and votes. Juan, I wanted to ask you about Native Americans. I was communicating with someone last night from Standing Rock Sioux uh, tribe, and they were talking about the big story in Wisconsin around Native Americans. Although it is harder to track, is that right? Because of who's identified demographically and who isn't. Yes, well, I think uh, certainly the Native American vote, not only in Wisconsin and uh, in uh, Montana and also uh, in Arizona, uh, has probably played a very big role uh, in Arizona, along with the uh, Latinx community. People talk about Maricopa County as being decisive in what happens in Arizona. Well, Maricopa County is 31 percent Latino. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's the biggest county, and it has a very big uh, share of the uh, 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 of, of the vote there. So I think that, um, uh, and, but in Arizona especially, I think, and uh, in, in a few other states, a Native American vote will be crucial. But the, uh, getting, to, getting the hard numbers is you know, going to take some time because the, the sample that the, these, uh, poll, uh, these uh, pollsters use uh, is so small that it's going to take a, a lot more digging to get the actual results. Well, uh, Juan, uh, even though, as you say, it's uh, it's very surprising that white women voters uh, voted for him in greater for Trump in greater numbers in this election than uh, they did in 2016, uh, given Trump's uh, consistent assaults uh, on uh, women of of all kinds. I guess the thing that that's striking is also the fact. I mean, Trump did win over 60 million votes, uh, 68 million votes that given what he's done and said to uh, and about African-Americans, Asian-Americans, uh, uh, the Latinx uh, uh, communities, that any increase, first of all, that any people would vote for him, and on top of that, that there would be an increase at all, even if marginal. Yes. Well, I, I, uh, I agree with you, Nermeen. I think the issue to understand, again, that's why I raise uh, the 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 nature of uh, U.S. imperialism. I do not think that we should underestimate the reality because everyone knew who, uh, why they were voting in this election. There was no, there were very few undecided voters. And I think one of the things that still has to be answered is how, once again, the polls were so wrong. Not about necessarily about the vote for. For Joe Biden, because most of the most of the polls gave Joe Biden about 51, uh, 51, sometimes 52 percent of the vote of 50, which is more or less what he's been getting. Uh, but that there, there was a severe underestimation in all the polls once again of how many people Americans were voting for Trump. Uh, and I think that we've got to understand increasingly these polls are, are highly suspect uh, and uh, cannot be trusted. Uh, but I think the key thing to understand is that 
unfortunately, and I've been saying this now for years when I get a chance to do analysis rather than just ask questions, is that there is a significant portion of the American elect of the American people, including among African Americans and Latinos and, uh, and other groups, who are perfectly happy with the United States being the world's imperial power, and who to some degree or other believe that they are invested in the continued national chauvinism and expansionism and bullying of America around the world. So this vote also represents, even if Joe Biden wins, that there, there are many Americans who are perfectly happy with our country being a rogue state in the world. Uh, and uh, and lording over the rest of the world and and insisting that it's it, its interests are first. There is a national chauvinist movement in America, uh, and a, a movement that believes authoritarianism is the way to go. We cannot underestimate this, and uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, the progressives will attempt. Uh, to uh, organize understanding that. And the work that has to be done, though, is in the white community, <laughs> is in among white Americans. That's where the organizing needs to be done, uh, because that is the population that is increasingly shifting more and more to a national chauvinist and a white supremacist uh, a view of the world. Uh, and I don't think that we can sweep that under the rug and act like it's not happening, because it is happening. And that's, I think, the key lesson that, yes, Donald Trump got more votes <laughs> this time than he got last time. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and there's a reason for that. And Juan, I mean, as you say, Trump did get more votes, uh, uh, 4 million at the moment, 4 million more votes this year uh, in this election than he did in 2016. And in 2016, when he won, there was almost universal consensus that he was an aberration. In other words, he was eccentric to what the Republican Party had been, what it stands for, whereas it's not really possible to hold that position now. Right, because I believe that he uh, he's he's an aberration in his personal conduct uh, and in uh, the way he carries out the office, but not in the policies uh, that he is implementing. Uh, the policies that he is implementing are pretty much in lockstep with conservative Republican policies uh, that have been developing for uh, decades. Uh, and that is why so many Republicans who, who really can't stomach the man still vote for him, because he is implementing the policies that, uh, that uh, they believe is uh, where the country should go, whether it's deregulation, whether it's on, uh, on, uh, on the climate crisis, uh, whether it's on uh, uh, immigration and so many other policies. He's implementing the policies on taxes. He's implementing the policies uh, that the uh, conservative Republican establishment wants. It's just that he does it uh, in such a corrupt, uh, venal, and personal uh, manner that it, uh, it's, it's hard to stomach him at the same time. Juan Gonzalez, we want to thank you for being with us. I'll see you tomorrow on Democracy Now!, a Democracy Now! co-host and professor at Rutgers University, speaking to us today from New Brunswick, New Jersey. This is Democracy Now!, when we come back, we head to Phoenix, Arizona, Arizona, a key battleground state. It was red. Is it turning blue? Stay with us.